We have our announcements this morning. They're up on the screen. This is a big day. We have a potluck. We haven't had one in eons, so I <laughs> guess I don't remember how long. So this will be a big day for us. Please do not forget the blood drive at the church on Tuesday. I will be in surgery, so I can't give, obviously, but <laughs> the rest of you need to all go and give for me, please. <laughs> do we have anything else that we need to do it? Oh, my. Okay. I'll move away. I wasn't loud enough. <sighs> Heaven forbid. <laughs> I guess that depends on. Oh, no, I didn't, but I was supposed to. The meeting will be very short if you all cooperate. Now that should be enough to make you all understand what you need to do. <laughs> I don't think there's anything more because that was the one thing that I was forgetting. So we're going to turn to our, our instrumental prelude, Created Me a Clean Heart. Thank you, Christopher. I hope you all listen carefully because we are going to learn that song coming up. Not today, but just hope you heard it. <clears throat> Arise and awake, O oh sleeper. Raise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Ephesians 5.14 Usually when I listen to Julie Scott as worship leader, I am inspired by something she says. This time she inspired me by something she wrote for the current Tiblo tidings. It was the reminder about Groundhog Day. She closed with the Bible verse I read earlier. If any of you know me, you may be aware that I like to sleep and usually can do it very well. Since I have been retired, I have learned just how long I can sleep. George will tell you that I sleep until noon every day. That is not true, <laughs> but I can do it on occasion. I have discovered that when, not if, I sleep until noon, nothing gets done the rest of the day. All of us cannot accomplish our purpose or missions for our lives or the life of the church if we are asleep and don't wake up when we should. 
If you are always asleep, you can't be ready when opportunities to further your purpose or the church pur purposes come to you. I am a heavy sleeper and don't always hear things when I am sleeping. I must arise and be awake and be awake to hear and understand what people are saying. If you call me and I am sleeping, don't trust what I say to you. The idea of arising is sprinkled throughout the Bible. A few books where it is found are Isaiah, Malachi, Matthew, Mark, and Ephesians. The list is not all encompassing, but I mention these because Jesus is speaking in many of them. I would be crushed if I couldn't answer when he directly called to give me instructions. I would feel worse if I went back to sleep and didn't get up and do something about what I had heard. I hope that as you pray, you make sure that you are awake when Jesus talks and then get up and do something about it. Let us pray. Father God, we know you hear our prayers. Help us be people who are awake to hear your answers and have the ability to put your answers into actions. In your son's name we pray, amen. Good morning. Please stand and join us in singing. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 5 of the classic Rayfon Williams tune, Kings Weston, followed by one verse of Surely the Presence of the Lord.
Be seated. Good morning. Good morning. I think we're a little bit more healthy this Sunday. Last Sunday, uh, quite a few of you were gone because of sickness, and we are grateful that you're feeling better. We know that this is the time of year that we have colds and flus and things like that, and so it's important that we continue to uh, be in touch with each other and help each other whatever way we can. Do want to speak to those who are watching us on YouTube and Facebook and want you to know that we are grateful that you are with us today for worship. It truly is an honor that you have chosen to watch our worship service today. We hope and pray that today's worship service will truly be meaningful to you, that you'll be touched by the Spirit because we know that God is everywhere, that God is not just limited to a sanctuary, but that God is there wherever you are watching us on YouTube or Facebook. And we also want you to know that with the different ministries that goes on here in this church, that you are welcome to participate. And that if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to call the office and we'd be more than happy to answer your questions. As was mentioned a, a few moments ago, uh, that we are going to have a, a blood drive and that it's going to be uh, uh, on the 7th, it's going to be from 11 to 3, and that if you know of somebody that might be, that's never given blood, I uh, encourage them uh, to donate blood because uh, there's never an oversupply of blood. And if a particular blood bank does have an oversupply, they always ship it off to other blood banks uh, that do need it. Um, also, just want to encourage you to stay not only for uh, the congregational meeting, to be, but also to be at the potluck. And at the potluck, uh, we'll be handing out sheets uh, at soliciting uh, ideas of well, what kind of uh, ministries that, you, uh, that we might want to pursue here at First Christian Church as we continue to do launching into the future. Starting on February 22nd will be the beginning of the Lenten season. And so on February 22nd, it's going to be Ash Wednesday, and that will have an Ash Wednesday service, which will be at 7 o'clock. And that uh, if you know of anybody that wants to come as visitors or perhaps folks who have not been here for a while, to encourage them to come to the Lenten service. Uh, that this is an important time that we prepare for the celebration of Jesus' uh, resurrection from death, the heart and soul of who we are. Now, other ways that we spend the time of the Lenten season is that it's a time that we reflect upon our relationship with Jesus. And that uh, out in the entryway that we have Lenten devotionals. And so I encourage you to pick up a copy of that and use that as part of your daily devotional time. Also, in your bulletin insert, you have uh, a sheet which uh, gives you uh, things to uh, give up for Lent or to start up for Lent. I cannot overemphasize this. I'll say this over and over again. This is not about willpower. This is not about whether you have the willpower to give up something or to start something. This is about us asking Christ to give up a habit, something that stands in the way of our relationship with Christ. That this is a way to be drawn closer to Christ. Or to start up something positive, some sort of positive behavior that you keep talking about doing but just haven't gone around to doing it. Now these are suggestions that are in the bulletin insert. And so you don't have to do any of those. There may be something else, but I, I, I listed these as a way to, to hopefully stimulate uh, some sort of commitment that you make during that time. But I also want to share with you that 
Whatever you decide to do, that it's not just something you do during Lent. It's something that you do that becomes a lifestyle change as a way that you can have a more intimate relationship with Christ. Are there concerns and joys that are to be shared at this time? Monica. So it's a, a prayer of joy that uh, Monica and David's niece, Amy, is now expecting into something that has taken a while, and so thanks be to God. Oh, Linda. Okay, so she guessed that she's happy that she's been married for 52 years. <laughs> I know that's a joke. I know that's a joke. I know that's a joke. But we are happy for you, happy for Megan, and also happy for your sister. Your sister-in-law uh, for her surgery. And George. For her surgery. Yes. Yes. So uh, Sheila's going to have surgery on her knee, and so we just pray that it will be a uneventful time for her. And I also do want to mention, I can't believe I've not already said this, um, 9 o'clock, 9.30, uh, Kathy Walker had surgery, and so um, uh, on her back, and that we just pray that this will alleviate the pain that she's been going through. And also pray for John. Uh, that this has also been a, a difficult time for him. Sean is now right now with him, and so uh, just keep John and Kathy in our prayers and pray that um, this, this is the turning point for Kathy in regards to her pain. Okay. So Jean and Lauren Brown uh, were diagnosed with COVID last Tuesday, so let's keep them in our thoughts and prayers. You say er Ernie? Yes. Okay. So let's continue to keep Ernie in our prayers. Uh, he has just really suffered. He suffered a lot of pain uh, for, uh, for various reasons, and we just pray that this, uh, him seeing the physician assistants uh, will be a turning point for him. John. So, so if you didn't hear John, he's just very thankful for all the prayers as he's been going through radiation treatments, and so... Uh, he's almost done. Hallelujah. <laughs> Any other concerns or joys? No. Oh, Julie. Yeah, a few weeks ago when Morgan was here and asked for prayers, um, baby Emmett Charles has arrived, and Brad and Morgan and Emmett and Ezra are home, and everybody's safe and happy, and um, I'm just grateful for the prayers that, uh, for them. So it's a celebration. Awesome. Yay! <laughs> so Emma Charles uh, Roush uh, was born, and so uh, the uh, Julie now has four grandchildren. Three. Three. Yeah, the fourth was not yet arrived. <laughs> yeah, that one's sitting right there. But it'll, it'll be four. It'll be four. Are there any other concerns or joys? Certainly, I know that all of you have been doing this, but just want to continue encouraging you uh, to be praying for launching into the future, uh, that this is about what God wants in terms of what new direction, what new chapter uh, that we're to go. Let us now pray.
loving God. Part of what it means to be a church is that we do really come to know each other. Whether it's this may be simple, maybe even might even say trivial things to the most serious thing. Loving God is important that what I'm really excited by during this time is that people are not only sharing their concerns, but also their joys. And that's important, dear God, is that for us, not only just to say, hey, God, help me, but also to say, thank you, God. And the third thing, dear God, is to say, what can I do to repay you? What can I do to serve you as a way to repay you? Now, we can never fully repay you, dear God. That will never happen. But that, dear God, we can make that effort to show our appreciation by being your disciple here in this church, here in our family lives, here at our place of employment, here in the Bonner Springs community, here in your world, that we can do whatever we can to spread the gospel. That is why launching into the future is so important, dear God. It's that we that you've given us an opportunity. This is not about, dear God, the survival of First Christian Church. This is about the thrival of First Christian Church. This is about how we can blossom into ways that we didn't think was possible, but through you it is possible. And we know, dear God, that there are people out here in this community that is looking for a church home that have questions about you. That really want to connect with you. That really want to be a part of a community. Who want to make a difference in this community and in this world. And so I pray, dear God, that we will widen our imagination because we know that your imagination for us is beyond our comprehension. But may we, dear God, continue to expand further as to what that imagination, what that purpose and mission looks like here at First Christian. Because not only, dear God, will other people's lives be changed, but our lives will be changed. And that you become more real to us. Help us, dear God, live by the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So I'm going to share with you today two scriptural readings. Special music. Oh, special music. I am sorry. I apologize.
Thank you, Jack and Carol, and Cheryl, and David, and Pat, and Christopher. Appreciate it very much. Very cool. So our first scripture reading today is from Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. And if you wish to follow in your pew Bible rather than on the screen, it's on page uh, 1545. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from his goats. And he'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, who are, come, you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. And you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, 
and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He replied, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one the least of these, you did not do for me. And they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The second scripture reading uh, is the parable of the sower, sometimes referred to as the parable of the soil, or sometimes referred to as the parable of the seeds. And that's on page 1607 in your pew Bible. It's Luke chapter 8, verses 4 through 8, or it's up on the screen. While a larger crowd was gathering, the people were coming to Jesus. From town after town, he told this parable. A farmer, excuse me, a farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew with it and choked the plants. Still others fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than it was sown. And some translations say 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold, depending on what translation you read. Not translation, but books of the, of the gospel, so I should say, not translation. This passage, I suspect makes us uncomfortable. I certainly would confess that at times in reading this passage, if I'm reading it honestly, it makes me uncomfortable. How do we judge when we are at a stoplight and there's a person holding a sign asking for money? Do we give them money? Or are we reluctant to give the money because we're afraid they're going to misspend the money on alcohol, drugs, cigarettes, or junk food? Or do we make that judgment that, oh, you know what, they probably brought trouble upon themselves. They deserve to be in the position that they are in, even though we do not know their story. Consider the great commandment commandments that Jesus told that he expects us to follow, to love God, to love everyone, and to love ourselves. Are we following Jesus' command to love our neighbor when we look the other way when a person is in need? Could it be possible that the person pushing a grocery cart with all of his or her life possessions is Jesus himself? 
Jesus in today's Bible reading is saying to love him means that we are to love the man and woman who are unwashed in unwashed clothes, talking to him or herself, drunk, smelling bad, and obnoxious. Jesus is powerfully saying that if you really know and love me, then you'll love people who are degraded, not accounted for, ignored, and hated. Jesus pulls no punches. In verse 46, he tells that if you do not care for the naked, the lonely, the thirsty, the hungry, the sick, or in prison, they will experience eternal punishment. But if that you care for the least among us, then one will experience eternal life. Today's Bible reading, it constantly bounces around in my head. In verses 31 through 33, Jesus is speaking about God's judgment. He uses the example of a shepherd separating the sheep from the goats. And God will do the same thing with us in heaven. Verses 34 through 36. Jesus tells us to who receives salvation. He states that those who will be blessed is when people care for Jesus. When he is hungry, thirsty, and invite him as a stranger and provide a clothes when naked and care for him when he was sick and visit him when he was in prison. That's how we receive salvation. His audience was puzzled. They had never seen him hungry, thirsty, sick, invited him as a stranger, provided clothes, and visited him in a prison. For me, verse 40 is the key verse. Verse 40. Jesus is direct and startling, and he says, Truly I say to you, what you did to one of these who are the least of my brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. Notice he says, uh, to these brothers and sisters of mine. He claims these people as though they are his brothers and sisters. Remember that Jesus' understanding of family is not biological. It's not about your blood relatives. It's not about your siblings. It's not about your parents, though that is part of what he understands family. Remember that Jesus had tension with his own family. That's in the scriptures. Because his understanding of family goes beyond that circle. It goes towards everyone, including those who are struggling. Have you ever met someone and that you discovered that you have mutual friends? We'll just make up a name, Joe. And that you say to this person that you met for the first time, well, gee, if Joe's your friend, then you're my friend as well. And that is what Jesus is telling his audience. The outcasts of society are his brothers and sisters, and that is to be understood literally. Jesus is saying that if you care about me, then you will love the misfits of the world, and that is how we come. And this is important. This is how we truly come to know and love Jesus. It's loving the misfits of the world. Jesus continues with a blunt warning. Truly, I tell you, what if you did not do to one of the least of these? You did not do it to me. Jesus did not hold back. To love and to know Jesus is to share Christ's love to all people, not just people that like us, whom we know or comfortable with. In fact, Jesus says, in terms of loving your enemies, that Satan does that. To love and know Jesus means that we love people different from us just as well. Now, I've gone to the church all my life. 
But growing up as a kid, the only, there's only one story I remember a preacher saying when I was a kid, when that is when I was less than 10 years old. And the story is, is that there was this boy that was interested in fires. And then he learned about firefighters. And that at every Halloween, he would dress up as a firefighter. And that if there was any movie, television show about firefighting, that he would watch it. And if there was anything that he was aware of in terms of books or magazines about firefighting, he would learn about it. And then after he had graduated, he was trained to be a firefighter, but he never went out to do firefighting. Instead, he continued to learn more about firefighting. In fact, he even wrote articles and books about it. But he never really knew what firefighting was about because he never had that experience of being in the midst of firefighting, of knowing of the, t the tension that goes on, the details that a person could not just know intellectually or in an abstract way, that he never got to know firefighting in a real way. And I'm afraid sometimes that is how we treat loving Jesus, is that we love Jesus more like, a fire, uh, uh, like the, the, the guy did in regards to firefighting. That we have to engage with people that makes us uncomfortable, that really needs Christ's love. Second story I want to share with you is the, the story that uh, the, the, the second Bible reading that I shared. It's one that we're familiar with, which is uh, sometimes called the parable of the sower, or the parable of the seeds, or the parable of the soil, soils, in which a farmer throws out seeds on this path, and it's, there's a, lots of traffic, and it gets trampled on, and that birds come by and devour it. And then seeds are thrown on rocky soil. Because it lacks nourishment in the soil and lack of moisture, it's unable to grow. And then you have seeds that are thrown in the thorns and that it starts to grow, but then are thrown out by the thorn bushes. And then you have seeds that are thrown on rich soil and it grows 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. To experience the richness of Jesus means that we are to have a relationship with him. Jesus is not an intellectual or abstract concept. Jesus tells the parable to remind us the multiple ways the church and our lives flourish when we, flour when we plant ourselves in Jesus' rich soil. To be in relationship with Jesus is not casual. It is nitty-gritty. It is personal. It is very intimate. That's what it means to love Jesus. The blessings go beyond ourselves. It goes towards even the least among us. When the church loves Jesus out of humility, sincerity, and commitment, it means that we are then living in Jesus' rich soil. And then we become aware of the plan Christ has for us. And then we can, can fulfill God's calling to minister to the sick, the thirsty, the hungry, the lonely, the imprisoned, and naked. A couple of weeks ago, I started the sermon series on God's purpose and mission for this church, which the first Sunday was the purpose that we have for the church, that is to share Christ's love. And of course, then today I've been talking about loving Jesus, which is the first part of our mission. Of course, the rest of, the, of what I'll talk about in the following Sundays is growing together, serving others, and reaching the world. To love Jesus has implications for our lives, community, of how we can be changed, 
how Bonner Springs can be changed. To love Jesus brings changes in other people's lives and our own. My hope and prayer is that the series on the purpose and mission will put, plant the seeds of how First Christian can continue to grow in our love for Jesus, in which I want to be clear, I think you folks do have a genuine love for Jesus, but that we must not be self-satisfied, but know that we can continue to grow in that love, which I believe is what today's Bible lesson is ch challenging us to do. Knowing that it will make a difference for our personal lives and the ministry of Jesus Bonner Springs and elsewhere. Let us now bow our heads for a word of prayer. Loving God, this passage is truly one that, if we're really being honest about it, is sort of in our face, not sort of is in our face. Because we want to think about loving you in a comfortable and easygoing way. And that's true. That in some ways that's true. But we're reminded, dear God, that, that it has to go beyond just loving you when it's just convenient. It means, dear God, that there, that there are people out there that we may not want to associate with or that we're not comfortable with but that you want us to be associated with knowing, reminding us that, hey, they are our brothers and sisters. They are Jesus' brothers and sisters, that we are all one and that we are to find ways of how we can work together to make it the kind of wholesome, shalom kind of world that you want us to become. And so I pray, dear God, that we look at this passage today, I should say passages today, not only of the challenge that we have, but of the richness of life that comes when we plant ourselves in your fertile soil. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Please join us in singing our communion hymn, One Bread, One Body. As we're here at this table, we recognize that perhaps some of you have not accepted Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior, that you wish to come forward and make that confession, that profession of faith. And if you do wish to do that, that you can do so during our final song at the end of the service. 
This is truly a humbling time to come here at the table as we are reminded of how Jesus met with his ragtag group, people that were quite diverse in background, but who yet Jesus brought together and truly ended up making a huge difference in lives that would never have been imagined by the twelve that night. Before the meal began, Jesus took a loaf of bread. He broke it in half. And he says, this represents my broken body. Whenever you eat of it, do so in memory of me. Then he took a cup of wine and he blessed it. And he says, this cup represents the blood that will be shed for all of humankind for the forgiveness of sins. This is the promise. This is the covenant I make. I will be with you until the end of time. Let us pray. Oh God, we ask in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread of the souls to the souls of all those who receive it, that they may eat this bread in remembrance of the body of your son and witness to you. O oh God, that they may always have his spirit with them. Amen. Lord, as we continue in prayer, we ask your blessing on the cup. Remembering that it was the cup that shed your blood for us. It's not only to remember what has been done, but the promise of your return. And that as you are the head of the, the body of Christ, that we are the body, that we together are knit together as we share this meal. As we become more aware of our body, that we are your hands and feet, help us to <coughs> grow in that love and that understanding as we partake of this meal. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let us pray. Faithful Father, thank you that you give the gift of abundant eternal life. Everything we have is a gift from you. As we bring our offerings to you, we give back to you from the abundant blessings you have given us. May our gifts be acceptable in your sight. Blessing and glory be unto you forever and ever. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand and sing with us our closing hymn, In the Name of the Lord. I had not heard of this song, but I really liked it. It just, at least for me, was very soothing and inspiring. Um, I saw Sharon pull up here. So if you wouldn't mind uh, staying around for a few minutes for our congregational meeting. And then I hope that you'll also stay, if you're able to, uh, for the potluck. And then also at the potluck, we'll be handing out sheets at which you'll have an opportunity to share ideas of potential ministries that Christ may be wanting us to have here at First Christian Church. So let us now bow our heads for a word of prayer. Loving God, we are so grateful for this opportunity to come here to worship you. We know that there's many reasons as to why we come for worship. Sometimes, dear God, we come here just because we're tired and weary and other times, dear God, we come here with questions. But other times, dear God, as we're reminded today through the scripture uh, from Matthew, that we are to be challenged, to know that we're never to be complacent in our faith, but that there are ways, dear God, that you are asking us to stretch our understanding of what it means to love you. That when we love all people, then we begin to have a, a better knowledge and a more open relationship with you. So I pray, dear God, that as we leave here today and in the months and years and throughout the rest of our lives, that we'll truly continue to do the best we can in loving all of our brothers and sisters. And together we all say, Amen. Amen.